Welcome folks to another edition of our Cody Connects webinar series. Today we are talking with, with four amazing women who are working for women in community. This recording will be made available to all in our Cody International Institute's YouTube channel. And also for our Cody graduates, the materials will be available in Cody Connects. So I would like to introduce Robin, who is going to come in, tell us a little bit about herself and introduce our panelists today. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Women Working for Women in Community at Cody Connects webinar. I am Dr. Robin Neustader and I am a program teaching staff at Cody International Center um, Institute um, in the International Center for Women's Leadership. I'll be moderating today's webinar, which is featuring the four current women's leadership research fellows who are Dr. Olienke Adeyeni, Dr. Mamatha Achanta, Tigis Kasahun Temesken, and Abiduin Isiet. They will be presenting on who they are, their work in their respective countries, and the action research plans for their research fellowship. After their individual presentations, there will be a discussion, and I will provide a more detailed introduction of each research fellow before their presentation. Uh, just to give a little bit more of information about the Women's Leadership Research Fellowship, now in its third year, this fellowship is an opportunity for graduates of Cody's Women's Leadership programs to build knowledge and practice while carrying out a community-driven action research project in their respective communities. This one-year fellowship begins with a one-month residency at Cody. While here, the fellows are supported by Cody staff to examine and develop ideas for their action research, participate in a certificate course, as well as present and network with others to develop their practice. Full of ideas and enthusiasm, they are now preparing to return to their communities at the end of this week once home and engaging with community partners to develop and implement the action research projects, the fellows will continue to receive some support from Cody. Just going to go over a few of the objectives of this webinar today. So the objectives are to highlight the research fellows and their efforts in community development leadership exchange women's leadership knowledge and practice with the broader Cody Connects community, as well as others interested in this work. Foster ongoing learning in regards to action research and women's leadership and community development. Foster and connect with the growing network of Cody alumni and development practitioners. Cody Connects put out webinars on a regular basis as a means to connect with graduates and others interested in this type of work. Now on to the research fellow. Okay, so it's my great pleasure to introduce today Dr. Ola Olienke Adiani. She is the executive director and founder of Women on the Watch Society Initiative, a not-for-profit organization based in South Africa. She is also the founder of the Center for the Protection of the Girl Child based in Nigeria. Her passion is to develop women and girls for economic, social, and emotional stabilities. Dr. Adiani's education is in law, and she has nearly 20 years of experience in legal practice. Olienka is a researcher, a women's rights advocate, marriage and youth counselor, motivational speaker, and a prolific writer. Thank you very much and good morning. My name is Olayenka Dini. And I'm the founder of Women on the Watch Society Initiative South Africa. The presentation this morning is about my the fellowship projects that I have in the next one year in South Africa. And is on improving sexuality education for teenagers in South Africa. Basically, this presentation will be about the introduction of the research the assumptions that brings it up, the aims and objectives, the research questions, the importance of the project, the methodology that would take, and the expected outputs. Myself and the organization of Women on the World Society Initiative would be taking up this project. 
Women on the World Society Initiative is a not-for-profit organization registered in South Africa. We are into women and children's rights, issues, and development. We engage communities in development issues. We are into advocacy and outreaches, and we also do research. I have a team of women on the Women on the World Society Initiative platform, basically made up of women from different professions and different fields of life. And myself, alongside with these women, would be taking up this project together in South Africa. Now, we'll introduce the project. Um, during the course of my doctoral program, which I concluded last year, I researched on child marriage in Nigeria, but I did a comparative study of sexual abuse as a part of, as I, I, did, a, I did a comparative approach study of child marriage in South Africa and looking at sexual abuse as a part of it. So I came to the realization that teenage pregnancy is a huge problem in South Africa. And from research, the prevalence is higher than in US and in UK. Now, even before, shortly before I came here in October, there was a publication in Soweto News about a teenager who impregnated three girls amongst his classmates. And there's the realization that probably the current sexuality education in South Africa is not effective. And so Women on the World Society Initiative will be looking into this, why we engage the community, the teens, the schools, and the government to solve the problem. What are the assumptions that we have in mind to bring up this project? We are assuming that teenage age is a time whereby the experiments, teenagers are naturally inquisitive, and so they engage in sexual activities. This sexual activity can result in pregnancy, we are assuming that the current sexuality education in South Africa is not adequate to meet the needs of these teenagers. We are assuming that solutions to the issue of teenage pregnancy will be identified through this project and that the results can be informative and adapted in other places. The aims and objectives for this research, like I said, or the project, is that we want to explore ways of improving sexuality education for teenagers so as to reduce or prevent this issue of teenage sex related problems, particularly teenage pregnancy. And so we'll be taking up Sushangufe area and Acadia as a pilot focus area. We are aiming to identify the level or the grade at which sexuality education should be initiated among teenagers. There is the assumption that there is um, a teenage, teenage sexual education presently takes place in the schools through, the, through what we call life orientation and life skills, both in the junior and the senior grades. From research, we realize that from grades, from grades one to seven, which forms the lower grade in, in South Africa, we have teenagers like up to 14 years, and a lot of them are sexually active at that particular time. Or I know, despite the fact that there are the interventions of this sexuality education, we still have problems of teen sex that are teen sex related. And so we hope that through this project, we'll be able to identify the particular grade or level at which sexuality education should be initiated among teenagers. We are hoping that we'll be able to determine the impact of the current sexuality education on teenage pregnancy. And we are hoping that by this project, we'll be able to inform policy reform on sexuality education in South Africa. Now, what are the possible effects and effective ways of improving sexuality education? This forms the major part of our research questions. Our research questions follows our objectives and this is the most important one. But we'll also be asking these questions, at what grade or level of school should this education be initiated? Does the present sexuality education curriculum have an impact on teenage pregnancy in South Africa? And what is the necessary policy reform for adequate sexuality education? Well, we're talking about the significance of the research, 
it is important for decision making for women on the world society initiative because it will help us to determine our programs what do we take up as advocacy programs what do we teach how do we go about it it will be important because stakeholders will be able to participate in a citizen-led change in south africa it will be important for south africa because it will help them to somehow resolve this issue of teenage pregnancy and other teen related sex problems. It will be important for the generation of teenagers in South Africa, as we find this teenage pregnancy very high amongst them. And you know, when a girl gets pregnant, most likely she will drop out of school. It would affect her future. It will affect her access to future, future possibilities. And we know that when that happens, it will affect the community. And so this research would lead to a positive impact in the generation of teens. Also, this project will be a pilot one for similar African countries. Now I want to talk about the methodology that this project would use. It will be an action research approach which will involve a collaboration with the community. We'll collaborate with the teenagers, we call them learners in South Africa, students in school age, will involve the governments, the schools, the communities and the NGOs. These teenagers will be the team researchers. Everybody will be involved in gathering data, analyzing it, coming up with recommendations and suggestions for the program at the end of the day. We'll be doing interviews, We'll be doing desktop and library research, and myself and WOW, Women on the World Society Initiative, will coordinate the project. The expected output that we have is the fact that we'll be able to identify the area of improvement in the current sex education curriculum. We'll be able to en engage the community in citizen-led change for a problem of society concern. We'll contribute to the academic body of knowledge in the area of research. We'll be able to disseminate information in the area of research and lastly, we'll be able to inform policy reform on sex education in South Africa. Those are the things that we'll be able to do as a result of this project. Thank you very much. So I'm here now to um, introduce Dr. Mamatha Chanta. It's my pleasure to introduce her this morning. So she is a woman and a children's rights act activist, pro bono lawyer, and founder of Taruni, a non-government organization working for the welfare of adolescent girls and women for more than 18 years. She co-founded Network of International Legal Activists to help the non-residential Indian women who are facing marital and labor problems in other countries. Mamatha has conceptualized Barosa, an integrated support center to access justice um, for child abuse and rape victims without getting re-victimized during the legal process. Thank you, Robin. Uh, I'll be talking about my work first, then about the research topic. I've started working with the uh, uh, girl children in rural villages of uh, Telangana in India. Uh, started working for sensitizing those girls. And also, I, have, uh, I could identify many problems the girls were facing. So the first one was child marriage. There were a lot of child marriages happening and we started stopping those uh, child marriages. We could stop about hundreds of child marriages. But the law was very old, 80 year old law. So the penalizations were very low. So we had filed a public interest litigation with the National Human Rights Commission. And uh, with that, uh, uh, we could bring in a new legislation called uh, Prohibition of Child Marriage Act in 2006. Our main strategy was for prevention of the social evils. So we started with uh, uh, forming girl, girl child clubs called Balika Sanghas. We could, uh, uh, in 18 years, about 13,000 rural adolescent girls were sensitized on various issues and we could prevent um, child marriage and child trafficking and labor uh, uh, in these families. I uh, also worked on child labor with UNICEF in eradicating child labor, particularly in ginning mills in the district Warangal. 
and we also still work in those villages uh, and uh, we also work on trafficking issue particularly prevention because uh, at the source point um, through these uh, balika sanghas we help them that no they they're not trafficked and also we uh, we've been working on child sexual abuse um conceptualized a bharosa support center along with the police in telangana which i'll be talking later i'll be talking about the context how the children in india are and the child sexual abuse cases in india and also about the conviction rates and the, the bharosa initiative and about my research uh, fellowship uh, you know india is a big country with a uh, 40% children um, uh, 40% of the population are children below 18 years we have about uh, 33 million um, child uh, children working and uh, there is uh, one out of four children drop out and we also have uh, about 150 children go missing every day maybe trafficked uh, internal uh, um, migration so and we also have this child marriage problem where 42 percent girls are married early um, below 18. when you come to child sexual abuse in india we have uh, india has the world's largest uh, uh, number of sexually abused children and uh, uh, national crime uh, research bureau 2016 report says that there are uh, about 36000 cases reported in 2016 but this is a worldwide problem uh, we also have everywhere in the world this problem and uh, unicef report says 1515 million adolescent girls uh, aged between 15 to 18 have experienced forced sex but males males also have boys also have this problem uh, but the reporting is very low if you take uh, the uh, on the conviction rate in India, uh, it is about 16 to 19 percent, which was analyzed by Delhi High Court in New Delhi, um, which is very low compared to other countries like US, UK, Europe. We have about 60 to 80 percent uh, conviction rates. Telangana is uh, lower than any other state. We have 5 to 10 percent convictions um, in Telangana. So there is also a lot of re-victimization uh, of children in the legal process. So they don't uh, tend to report these cases because of these re this re-victimization and the stigma they face, the families face. So in um, Telangana, uh, we have uh, with the police, we could start uh, uh, a center called Bharosa, Bharosa <coughs> meaning the faith, the support. Uh, to mainly to reduce the re-victimization and bring in speedy justice. This is started by Telangana Police in collaboration with the uh, Women and uh, Child Welfare Department. It is registered as a non-profit because uh, that will have flexibility and sustainability. State Home Minister is on the board as a chairman and I'm the only external member in the executive body. And the Bharosa's success in two years led to starting of 24, 25 more centers in the state. Um, if you analyze the cases uh, in child sexual abuse, um, uh, which, were, which have come to Bharosa in these two, three years, we have uh, worked on about uh, 524 uh, child sexual abuse cases under POXO. Um, uh, below 10 years are 101 and uh, 11 to 15, 148. And there are above 15 years girls, 244. So 244 cases were mainly elopement cases of adolescents who were lured in marriage and sexual activity. If you see the male child abuse cases, they're very low. They're only 31, so they're underreported. Um, we had uh, dealt uh, in cases which were very successful. I would like to share one. A three-year-old girl uh, who was uh, 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 raped by a neighbor, this case came to Bharosa in the initial stages and uh, the girl uh, is of a single neglected parent and the girl was left with the 
neighbor um, by her uh, grandmother and in the night the neighbor raped the little girl and she was bleeding profusely and she was brought to bharosa on the same day and we had to put her in for medical care we had given her uh, the needed uh, counseling and also we helped her uh, in getting a permanent shelter and also she is now studying in a school and uh, we could also help uh, in the case uh, and we, uh, we could get life imprisonment for the perpetrator so this was one of the successful case uh, we have, and we could advocate successfully for getting a child friendly court which is a, um, which is a one of its kind in india and uh, um, uh, this uh, through this court we could uh, deal about uh, um, uh, almost uh, 60 cases uh, 30 got uh, uh, um, convictions so we could get only 50 percent convictions because the problem is again the teenage consensual uh, elopements which are reported in, under this law second is, is uh, evidences there are laps in evidences and also out of court settlements because the most of the time perpetrator is a family member or a community member a known person and also they compromise for uh, money uh, so still these are the challenges in getting 100 percent convictions so my research with cody will be to examine the challenges the mothers of these girl children uh, of sexual abuse victims face in accessing justice in hyderabad city i'll be working with these mothers i'll be empowering them to uh, demand for better and speedy justice for their daughters I'll all, my research uh, methodology will be personal interviews focus group discussions i plan to uh, create the support groups for the mothers so that uh, they can help each other in uh, fighting the cases in the court what is needed what else is needed uh, I think we have to concentrate on our parenting in India because negligence in parenting is uh, uh, leading to these child sexual abuse. So prevention is cure and also reporting abuse immediately, which is very much needed for uh, getting the convictions. And also police, maybe they have to build the capacities of the uh, lower staff and uh, public shaming of perpetrators is also needed and uh, we need a rape registry you can see the map there is we don't have a rape registry so victim assistance definitely we are also planning livelihoods for the families so this is about uh, my topic today and i feel that if we walk together a path will emerge with this positive note let us pledge to create safe spaces for children uh, in this world thank you so much Thank you, Mamatha. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Tigit Kasahun. She is a practicing professional architect and urbanist in Ethiopia. She is a Fulbright Hubert H. Humphrey Research Fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the United States. She is a lecturer in research at Addis Ababa University and the National Program Officer for UN Habitat Ethiopia. Her work addresses national and international issues in human settlement. Her current work looks at how to mainstream and empower women in design by looking at the role of gender in spatial planning for equitably inclusive city design. Um, thank you, Robin, and uh, good morning all. So my design, my design and research project is titled Gender and Space. Gender and Space, the role of city design for an equitably inclusive development. So you may ask why this project here in Cody. And in RIF, my story is that I studied and worked in the male dominated environment, architecture and urban planning, which is also considered to be a man's job in most parts of the world. So I always thought that I had to be and act like a man just to be accepted and be successful in our work environment. But then I started thinking that it's kind of okay to be a woman and not always try to prove yourself that you can do it. So the hazardous question for me was then how? That was why I applied and came here in 2014 to learn how the gender activists would reply to these questions and how they made it so far. So I came to Cody for the Women Community Development Leadership training and was inspired enough by the successful women that I met. We changed my mindset and 
prove that it's indeed okay to be a woman and still get where you want to get to be. In reality, it's indeed a bit challenging and you may need to be always one step ahead, but I would say it's doable. So I started thinking on how to integrate a gender sensitive design approach in my work and how to advocate in bringing more women in this field to have an equal representation and bring about gender sensitive outputs in our professional field. So then I started this design and research project that tries to show how CITES design approach to a gender lens will bring a shift from the existing inclusive inequalities to equitable inclusiveness in physical spaces in order to have fair cities and sustainable development. So to start with, I limited its focus on women and see the impact of city spatial design on women's development and then to expand the impact of knowledge and skills in achieving gender equity through city design. So gender equity exists in various forms and in various forms as in conflicts, politics, law, culture, religion, education, transportation, but spatial planning and design of physical spaces can be a tool that mediates and can serve as cross-cutting factor that can address these different issues. So what do I mean by physical spaces in addressing this issue? I divided it only into categories that I think it's be it best describes it. So the first one being spaces that we practice inequalities, which will result into spaces for inequalities. It can also be the vice versa as one is dependent on the other one. So the first one can be interpreted as spaces, as institutions that women get their educational and professional experience. And the second one are spaces that are shaped and designed as places, private public spaces, cities, countries, urban areas. So is the design of such physical spaces really important in bringing an, an equitably inclusive development for women is the question. And the answer can, is yes, these spaces mediate the educational, professional, social, and economic attainment of women. And if they're not designed through a gender lens, they will result into inclusive development as we may find everywhere, but in a very unequal way. So how are this design of these physical spaces became major challenges and problems, especially for women not to not equally benefit from the current socioeconomic development that is taking place. So let me give you some examples for both cases based on my experience in my country. So in the first case, I can give you three examples. In the university that I teach, which is a school of architecture and urban planning, there are less female arc enrollments and the majority of dropouts are female students. As a result, there are less women in this field, less gender sensitive curriculum and structure of organization. Women are less associated or experienced spaces in the built environments. Due to the safety in traditional norms and domestic gender roles, we are expected to stay at home. So we fell in trans exams for university that focus on how you describe and articulate a space in our cities. Women are time poor. The extra domestic burden makes us excel in our education and will be less, will, will be less competent to find jobs. As a result, women will still will not have leadership and decision making positions, which will then highly influence my second point that is physical spaces will end up being planned, designed, developed, and redeveloped by not seeing them through a gender lens, resulting into spaces for inequalities, which means places, infrastructure that are shaped and built, but fail to equally provide the necessary benefits for women from the available opportunities and resources. Therefore, we, we uh, need to pay, attentions, to pay attention to the clear and deniable differences between women and men that require gender sensitive interventions in designing and shaping places. That is, to promote equal access to work and study and other growing opportunities, there should be close proximity between the main socioeconomic infrastructure and neighborhood. Transportation, efficient road networks should be user friendly and route optimized. Safety and security should be improved by providing adequate street illumination and signage. So this benefits everyone, but often of a greater importance to women than men. So as an example, if I take my city at Ababa, which is the capital city of Ethiopia, it is the political capital of Africa, seat of African Union, and the second city to host the largest number of embassies next to New York. So due to this rapid urbanization and construction boom that is needed, the urban poor are being moved out from the inner city into new settlements into the outskirts of the city. 
which is almost 20 kilometers away from the city center where the major socioeconomic infrastructure are located. So the new built up physical spaces and new transport infrastructure, especially segregated urban landscapes, they wash away the, the, pub, the small public spaces and econ informal economics where most women make their living on. It did not consider women's safety and mobility needs. So it limited their opportunities and choices to equally benefit and engage from the socioeconomic development of the country. So when we see it in a major city scale, the university and city relationship on the left, you can see the settlement in gray and the location of the universities in black, which are, which are like how far and off roads the universities can be. So in addition, you can also see in the pictures, the industrial parks as they are the main economic drivers for employment generation and poverty alleviation. So you can see their location, their proximity to the city center, transportation. So women, it's hard for women to access and be part of this institution, thus not equally benefit from them. So what is gender sensitive design and planning of physical spaces? And they can start from small, for example, it can start from toilet door hangers for bags, parking spaces for pregnant women, as well as vibrant public spaces and streets. And it can go to the city scale to design polycentric cities with mixed use development and monocentric ones. Such equitable and inclusive city design intervention brings a difference into women's life. It gives them socioeconomic empowerment because they will be equally part of and benefit from the development of the economies. Therefore, therefore more women need you know, to be part of planning and design process. They need to be in position to make decisions that would ensure gender sensitive special planning leading to equality, equ equitably inclusive development. So I advocate for participatory design and all planners, designers should seek input for women. But by creating spaces that, make it, that makes it easier for women to fulfill both their family and professional work related obligation, I don't inadvertently validate conventional gender expectation that women must do all the work. Therefore, my vision is to frame a project proposal to initiate university courses and graduate women association that will mainstream, engage, learn, teach and practice and empower more women students and professional women into the field of architecture and planning to have a gender sensitive equitable places. So figuring out the best way to achieve gender equity in space is a work in progress. Gender sensitive city design and spatial planning are essential as communities grow. The need of redefining equality and promoting an understanding in this concept does not require elimination of diversity or build segregation of women for men. Planning with women in mind will ensure that the needs of multiple groups are met. So indeed, safe, equitable, inclusive, and fair cities should be for everyone. That gender sensitive planning will provide better places to live for everyone. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tigis. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Abidou and Isiat. She is the executive director of Abidou and Isiat Initiative for Girls, an organization committed to promoting safe spaces for girls and women in society. She is a politician and leader of Nigerian Women Trust Fund. Abiduin is the National Director of Women, Gender and Development Affairs of African Youth for Development Commission, Nigeria, and a resource consultant for European Center for Electoral Support in Nigeria. She is a gender activist, a community development expert, and an agent for social change. Thank you, Robin, for the introduction. Just reflecting on the presentation of my colleagues, we could say low representation of women in top decision making platforms in various sectors is one of the major reasons behind the gaps my colleagues are trying to bridge through their research work. So I'll be talking on enhancing women's participation in local governance through budget tracking. What will you learn? At the end of this presentation, you will understand local governance and gender roles, challenges of women in society and my political experience, case studies on how budget tracking can improve citizens' participation, follow demand, my role in AYTEC, which is African Youth for Development Commission, doing action research with the people. Slide three. The diagram you've seen is the overall narrative of what my presentation will be focusing on. 
First, the marginalization of women in decision-making platforms. Below is the current statistics of women in decision-making platforms in Nigeria. Seven females in the Senate, 109 senators. Out of the 62 councils in the Federal Capital Territory, Abuja, we have no women. The focus is on local governance. We believe the budget tracking is an entry point for women, for women's participation in governance. And through this, it's going to improve public service efficiency. So local governance. Local government is the most fundamental and closest in the delivery of public services. Local government provides five bone water, basic sanitation, public health, primary education, and local market. Looking at the function of the local government, we can see that it's similar to the women's gender roles. Women assess the rely and depend upon basic function of the local government more than men. Efficient public services equals to stress-free performance of gender roles by women. Women are marginalized in the society because they have no or little opportunity to influence the political, economic, and the social processes and institutions which controls and shape their lives. It has been argued that women need to be visible politically as women and be empowered to act in that capacity because they have needs different from those of men. This fact complements some of the national and international laws and policy that have been ratified and domesticated in my country, Nigeria. For example, we have the national gender policy, which provides, make provision for 35% affirmative action in decision-making platform. We have the CEDAW convention, and the target of CEDAW convention for 2015 was to have 30% of women in parliament and 50% in local government. Some other countries have achieved this. By 2015, that was the target. But Nigeria is too far from achieving this. Belgian Platform for Action 1995 also talks about inclusion of women in public and private sector. Now, finally, the SDG Goal 5.5. Ensure women's full and effective participation and equal opportunity for leadership at all levels of decision making in political, economic, and public sphere. my political experience. I contested for the office of a councillor, which is the lowest level of, uh, of political office in Nigeria, in my ward, Uruzu ward, under Abuja Municipal Area Council. My why? Because I wanted to improve public service efficiency. Women have marginalized in all sectors that controls their life and to improve public service efficiency. I ran under the ruling party, and I've been a member of the party for over two years. And my whole agenda was to get into the structure of the political party. My intention of running was not only to win an election, but to get into the structure of the party. The only position which you can confirm for women in political party is the position of a woman leader or a woman mobilizer, which I believe can't bring about any change <coughs> unless women start occupying key positions in political parties. So what happened? You know, it's very difficult making my intention known by joining this patriarchal system in political parties. Concerning what happened, I contested against five men. My aspiration was a glass breaking one event because I was the first woman to ever aspire to contest since the council was created since 1995. So I did my primary elections and the number of votes counted was more than the number of delegates that voted. So instead of the returning officer declaring my election, non and void, 
according to our electoral guidelines. The, it declared the election inconclusive in a way giving the electoral committee power to decide the result of the election. Who are these electoral committees? All men. So, and I'm sure, you know, the decision of the electoral committee was influenced by a lot of things. Patriarch is one of it. The next slide. So, on the case study, the picture you're seeing is about follow the money. It's a network of grassroots citizens who are dedicated to track government and international spend, making the government accountable to whatever allocation they have set out to achieve. Follow the money is a way of making local government accountable to the, to the village vigilance of local communities and organizations. I believe empowering grassroots women to follow the money is an entry point for women's inclusion in governance. You can follow the link and see more about the Follow the Money project. My role in AYDEC. Let me talk a little about AYDEC. AYDEC is African Youth for Development Commission. It's a new breed, of, it's a new breed and constituted in 2018 by some resourceful African youth like me, to serve as a unique strategic platform to chart a new course of action for African development in creating the Africa we want. Our goal is to create a, a unique and formidable network of, of African youth cluster towards Africa integration and mobilize her young people for development cooperation with the African region within the African region. So my role generally is to promote gender equality in the commission, support gender related programs, projects and policy, develop gender mainstreaming strategies, design and deliver capacity, and also to engage elected representatives to become accountable. Majorly my work is on identifying the development gaps and find a way to bridge the gaps using gender lens and approaches. I said AYDEC, I'm a board member of three national and international organizations, like Strong Enough Girls, Ladder Development Initiative, and Easy Medic Options. On the project, the Action Research. Action Research is a kind of research that engages all the stakeholders in a constructive manner, meaning you carry all the stakeholders throughout the process of the research in the problem and education, the data gathering, the analysis, and also dissemination of the result. It's all about empowering them to take ownership of the project. The process we involve, we're going to map out the women's community map, because I'm doing this project in a local council, which is my ward. We're gonna engage leaders, the local government, the women, and also empower the women to engage their local governments by teaching them about budget tracking. Our outcome majorly is to empower women and also inform policy, empower women with the skills needed to track the budget. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Abby. So now we're going to move on to the discussion So um, we heard some four fantastic women leaders, and we'd like to hear if you have any comments or questions for Ola, Abby, Mamatha, or Tigist. Um, they will come up and respond to your questions or comments. Um, so well, some of the uh, some of the comments that we've had, um, of course, of course, we have some wonderful some wonderful praise for the learning session itself. And I'm going to get Robin to acknowledge some of the comments that have uh, that have come through the uh, the chat. So we have a comment from Lakshmi who says, "In India, we have reservation for women in elections for local bodies," and also adding, "All the best, Abby, for the next election. Keep fighting." And 
here's a question for Abby from Toys C. Abby, I'd like to know how the non-conclusive election was eventually concluded. Thank you. Um, the electoral committee ended up picking a candidate on behalf of the party to represent the party in the general election. I submitted a petition to the electoral committee on the conduct of my election and for the committee to do another election. Unfortunately, two weeks after my election, the chairman of the committee was shot and he died in the process. So that's it. Thank you. Okay. So here's one of the questions. This is for um, everyone. So what motivated you to really work on women's rights issues? And then the second question for everyone, so we can each um, take a turn and come up and answer these questions. And the second question is, how has the fellowship advanced your leadership goals? Oh, thank you, Robin. Actually, what may, motivated me, I started working in the slums of Hyderabad where I saw the girls, their plight and their problems. So I thought that I should work. And another selfish uh, thing was I have only two sons. I wanted girls, and now I have 13,000 girls with me. <laughs> that was one thing. And uh, definitely women's rights has been a, a passion, a passion for me. And uh, been working on the various uh, issues, particularly health and empowerment of women. And uh, I think uh, the passion led to so many opportunities to work for the women and children in in back in India. So, and this fellowship, I never thought I'll get it because there was so much competition. And I'm very grateful to Cody for uh, helping me to do more research on the challenges the child sexual abuse victim face, their families face, so mm -hmm. that I can improve the centers in Telangana, the Barosa centers. Uh, definitely, I want to become a, a global leader, bring uh, uh, peaceful and uh, uh, environment for uh, women and children. And I think uh, these things will help me to become one. Thank you. And I also have see another question. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. The, uh, what aspired me okay, to go into this program? The World Economic Forum released a report in 2017 about the gender gap. They predicted that it will, it will take 100 years to close the gender gap. And I asked myself, why? Meaning my children's children will still be marginalized. So I took a decision upon myself to fight for the rights of the women in my society and try to close the gender gap before 100 years time. The fellowship uh, is helping me to be on the front line of change in my community. And I feel this is a very important way that is helping me to advance my leadership skill. Thank you. So uh, <clears throat> for the first question, what motivated me to work or the, for the leadership uh, on, and to work for women, uh, it's my students, I would say, uh, in the university and the challenge that they face in order to come to the university and sometimes sometimes to even uh, to access the university and their challenges. And then whenever they're late, the rules and regulation that would expel them from school whenever they're late or come late. Uh, or uh, so the rules and regulation and the, the female student will drop out because of so many reasons, just because they're female, motivates me to work more on women and so that they will be successful and not achieve whatever they uh, whatever they aspire to be uh, in the future. And this research fellowship and this research fellowship, what I would like to do is to work with my community, student community and my pro the professional peers that I have in order to work on transferable knowledge for a transformative project that will change women's life uh, in the future for a better one. Thank you. Thank you.
my motivation for this program is my passion for motivating women for all around empowerment. And in the course of this fellowship, I've learned a lot. And it has just really started. And I've realized that knowledge is not conclusive. It has no end. Even though I've been in research, at least I did my doctoral program, but I've never been, my heart has never been open to the issue of action research for citizen-led change, which this fellowship gives to me in the past three weeks now. I've really been empowered. Thank you. So here's an, another question for Abby. Abby, how do you intend to use the I follow to empower rural women who are not educated to track budget financing? Okay. Thank you. I think some of our partners have been able to invest in transcribing the budget into simple graphics that the local women can understand. So we have gone out of, you know, our way to have some, you know, to interpret the budget in graphics form that the rural women can understand. Okay, now we have a question for Mamatha. Um, Mamatha, how has, from Lakshmi, how has the judiciary brought on board to work with the police in Barossa? Uh, thank you, Lakshmi. Actually, um, there are child-friendly courts in Delhi and Bangalore. We went and saw those courts. We wanted something there, in uh, something similar in Hyderabad. And uh, we had contacted the Metropolitan Sessions judge in Nampalli. They were very cooperative. They said, we can go ahead. And we went to the acting chief justice, Ramesh Ranganathan, who was very cooperative. And we could start a court here. We could improvise that from Delhi and Bangalore. And it is one of its kind. You should visit Lakshmi this court. Thank you so much. Uh, so now I'd like to, um, I also want to just highlight that one of our co colleagues here at Cody. Naima Chowdhury is also working on specified gender budget tools. So um, it's something else to consider when looking at the work of the CODI and the, how it connects with the research fellows works. Um, so we have a question here for Tigist. Um, Tigist, what more can we do to in academic spaces to help young women see their leadership potential? So the first thing I, uh, I would say that that all curriculums somehow they should be revised so that they'll have a gender lens through it or gender sensitive uh, curriculums should be there because most of them are somehow uh, have been um, they have been uh, there through uh, not being seen through the gender lens. So most female students are not comfortable <coughs> or it's not the, uh, some gen uh, female students issues are not incorporated in most of the curriculums. And gender mainstreaming and having gender oriented activities within schools usually brings the awareness of how female students should be equally and uh, equally uh, participate within all activities and um, all activities and classes. So female students should should have somehow leadership positions in activities and they need to have storytelling so that everyone will be uh, aware of how uh, students um, should be like in spaces in universities. They should bring out their stories and have role models and more uh, successful women should come and be guest lectures so that the female students can see that success is somehow there everywhere within like the female women community. Thank you, Tigis. We have a question from the room for Ola. The question is, Ola, as part of your research, will you engage with teens who are currently pregnant or recently pregnant and ask for their input on what would have helped them? Thank you very much. Yes. We'll be working with teenagers who have been pregnant and out of the school system because it will involve the community as a whole. We are working with all stakeholders that are involved. We'll be working with parents, religious communities within those two communities. We'll be working with youth clubs and other NGOs, non-governmental organizations who are working with youth. So it will include those students within the academic system, within the school system, and outside it. Thank you.
Thank you, Ola. We have a question from the from online from Johnway, and his question um, is for Abby. So, Abby, how challenging is it to fight corruption through the Follow the Money initiative in a country where there is rampant corruption? Corruption. Thank you very much. It's very challenging, and you know, security life is almost is also life threatening. And what we do is to put security measures in place and also work as a team. So when you are following up the money, you don't go single-handedly as a person. You carry your team along and inform your team wherever you are going. But the tactics we have used is also to carry the members of the community affected by that project along. So we push them forward to demand that accountability and we stay at the back seat. When the people in elected offices that is the community that is demanding this change, then they know that you can't arrest the whole community. You have to expect change. So that's how we do it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Abby. Um, so I'd like to thank everyone for their um, presentations and their responses to the multiple questions that have come in from the floor as well as from the room. Oh, there's one last question. For Abby, if she's prepared, the politician <laughs> never stops. So Abby, how are you engaging women political leaders in Nigeria on the I Follow budget tracking project that you're proposing? Thank you very much, because it's um, election time in Nigeria and we felt it's a most important need to make budget tracking or accountability part of the political agenda. So we engage all the grassroots women leaders who are members of the political parties along in all throughout the process of the budget tracking by educating them about the importance of the budget tracking and also asking their candidates or candidates or aspirants critical questions about how they want to ensure accuracy and accountability when they are elected into office. And we're using the women leaders as a major target because they are closest to the people who are going to be elected in 2019. So um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us um, and engaging in this um, webinar this today. Um, we're going to um, sign off. Um, this, as Wendy noted earlier, that this webinar will be available um, on the Cody Connects um, YouTube channel at shortly. So thank you and have a great day.